The following podcast contains explicit language. You're listening to the Cinematography Podcast presented by Hot Rod Cameras, a program about the art, craft and philosophy of the moving image and the people who make it happen. Coming to you from the world headquarters of Hot Rod Cameras in Hollywood, California, are your hosts, Ben Rock and Ilya Friedman. Hello, Mr. Rock. How are you today? I'm doing swell, Mr. Friedman. I don't know if anyone listening to us in podcast land uh, will notice, but it's profusely raining in Los Angeles. So if you hear a little bit of rain, you know. You know what that is. And there was thunder like half an hour ago. There was a lot of that going on. Yes, freaking me out. Yeah, we never get thunder here in LA. I was talking to my father about it and he was like, I like the rain and he lives in Florida. So the rain is like warm and overpowering and forces you to go inside. But if you go outside, it's like getting a hot shower. He was like, what's it like there when it rains all day? I'm like, you're just kind of damp and cold. Yeah, like, that's accurate. And you didn't even tell people the best part about rain in LA, the traffic, the traffic oh, and well, the driving no, in LA is, is a whole thing. Nobody knows how to drive in LA to begin with. And then add water to that. And people don't think that you drive differently in the rain. No, you, well, I, actually, you, you drive slightly differently. You drive faster. That's what you do. Yeah, drive faster. You get there faster. Yeah, drive more <laughs> recklessly. Anyway. Hey, Ben, uh, who's uh, on the show uh, today? Enough about freaking weather. We have one of the most exciting guests we've ever had. I'm not even kidding. Burying the uh, lead here. Oh, my God. I could not be more excited about this. You know, Ilya, in, in, in 2013, when we started this podcast, I think we might have kicked around the idea of, hey, maybe if we do this long enough, we could get, like, you know, Bob Richardson on the show. Bob Richardson. Yeah. Holy shit. I could not be more excited. But, I was wetting my pants that we got to talk to Bob Richardson. And wait, then, yeah, exactly. And then it got even better. Not only did uh, a certain someone find out that Bob Richardson was going to talk with us, but then we got a request that Anton Fuqua would also like to talk with us. Holy crap. Anton Fuqua. So these two guys made a pretty amazing film, a very powerful film called Emancipation that you can get on Apple TV Plus right now. I don't know if it's still in theaters. Just gorgeous, beautiful, powerful stars Will Smith. And Ben Foster, holy crap, Ben Foster, yeah, incredible. such a great actor. And 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 it really, it's sort of like a chase thriller mixed in with everything else. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, yeah, it's so good. So Antoine Fuqua, if you're not super familiar with him, you should be. But I remember him all the way back when he did the Gangsta's Paradise video for Coolio in the 90s. Nice. And he also directed one of my favorite thrillers ever, and that's Training Day. Just mm. such a... Top to bottom, brilliant. He is such a great director. Bob Richardson, I wish we could have talked to him longer. I feel like I could talk to him for an hour and a half about Natural Born Killers or Fast, Cheap, and Out of Control or Snow Falling on Cedars. He's made some of the best looking movies of the last 40 years. It was a really good interview, and it sounds like we're going to get that chance. So I'm excited about round two with, with Bob. That'll be a lot of fun. Yeah, hopefully we can talk to him again, because I would seriously love, like I'm s slowly collecting people who shot stuff for Errol Morris, mm -hmm. and he mm -hmm. shot uh, all of Fast, Cheap, and Out of Control, and like half of Mr. Death. Not to mention like all of my favorite Oliver Stone movies, and all of Quentin Tarantino's movies starting with Kill Bill until today. I love bringing out the dead. I think that bringing out the dead is a fantastic looking movie too. It's like it's it's really dynamite. Yeah. But before we get into that, we actually have kind of an urgent close focus, and that's the freaking ASC award nominations just came out. That's true. They did, and it's a it's a great selection of uh, nominees this year. Several of whom have been on the show, so that's that's really cool. You know, people like David Mullins he got nominated, and uh, Greg Frazier got nominated. Uh, Claudio Miranda, this uh, Darius Kaji. Yeah, let, let's go through it a little bit. So let's talk first about theatrical features, sure. Because I feel like I mean, obviously, every single one of them is noteworthy, and I'm not, I wouldn't take one away, but I would also say there are some omissions that I would love to see corrected. <laughs> <laughs> when, it's not going to happen. Not going to happen. Mean, the now. thing is yeah. that, like, who wins the ASC award is not a hundred percent likely to be the nominee and winner for best cinematography in the Oscars, mm -hmm. but it's a pretty fair indicator. I agree. So we got Roger Deakins for Empire of Light, Greg Fraser for The Batman, which I, when we had him on the show, I think I said that to him it was like, you know, if Dune and The Batman had come out the same year, he probably would have been nominated for them both. Darius Kanji for Bardo, False Chronicle of a Handful of Truths. That's going to be on Netflix. 
Yeah, and Claudio Miranda for Top Gun Maverick. And and uh, if you really enjoyed the cinematography of uh, Top Gun, I think it's totally worth going back and listening to our uh, interview with uh, Michael Fitzmaurice, who did, of course, the aerial cinematography for that movie. There's so much aerial DP work in that that uh, it, it's it's absolutely worth listening to that episode. Yeah, Claudio Miranda did amazing cinematography for that, but he did the stuff that made you shit your pants. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> like, yeah. The crazy stuff. And then uh, Mandy Walker, who we had on the show for Elvis. Of course. Mandy's awesome. Elvis looks great. You know, I'm just going to say it out loud. Uh, Larkin Seipel should be on this list. I feel like everything everywhere all at once should at least be nominated for almost everything. And I think Larkin's work was fantastic. I'm kind of shocked that Robert Richardson isn't on this list. His work in uh, Emancipation is just beautiful. An interview we did a long time ago, actually, way back uh, for Sundance, Andrew Wheeler, he was nominated for the Spotlight Award for God's Country. And there's a couple other people in there, uh, Kate McCullough, ISC for The Quiet Girl, and Strula Brandt Goven, hope I said that correct, for War Sailor. But uh, Andrew Wheeler, I was delighted to see that uh, on there. God's Country is a beautiful looking movie. It's a lot of fun. So uh, wor- definitely worth watching if you, you haven't seen it. Th- then for a one hour non-commercial television series, I guess that's like uh, premium cable kind of stuff. Th- that's you exactly right. John Conroy for Westworld, which is, I think, already off of HBO Max. And yeah, and removed. <laughs> so no one can ever see it <laughs> no- again. So. Nominated and removed. Uh, Catherine Goldschmidt for House of the Dragon. You can still see that on HBO. Yeah, that's that's st- that. <laughs> still still going. Alejandro Martinez, also for House of the Dragon. Uh, it's going to split the vote. Yeah. David yeah. Mullen, a friend of the David show. David Mullen, friend of the show. Yeah. For The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, which is just a magical, beautiful, amazing show. And Alex, I'm going to hope I say this correct, Nepo Niaschi. Uh, I, that's terrible. I think I think I broke, uh, but also for Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, might split the vote there for a particular episode called Everything is Belmore. And Nicholas Summerer for 1899, which I have not seen. I need to check it out. I've been hearing it. It's really good. It's on Netflix. Yeah. Worth seeing for sure. Uh, in the pilot limited series or motion picture made for television category, Todd Bonzal, ASC, for Winning Time, which let me tell you, really, really great looking show. Lo- loved it. Jeremy Benning, friend of mine, hasn't been on the show yet. We got to correct Get that. him on here for this too. Yeah, I know. For hey, Guillermo uh, del Toro's Cabinet of Curiosities. Beautiful yep, show. That, you watch that on Netflix. Uh, Ana, Anastas. Anastas Michos. Yeah, Anastas Michos, okay. For Guillermo del Toro's Cabinet of Curiosities, The Autopsy, which is a phenomenal fucking episode. And everyone mm-hmm. should stop listening to this right now and go check that out. Uh, C. Kim Miles, uh, ASC, CSC, MYSC for Lost Ollie which is uh, also a Netflix show. And then Sean Porter for The Old Man, which uh, oh, it was was very popular. Such right a now. great show. Such a great show. This is one of my uh, favorite categories next up, which is the uh, episodes of a half hour series. And friend of the show, Adam Bricker, nominated for Hacks. Hell yeah. Which is great. Uh, Carl Hurst for Barry, which I uh, you know you and I are both big fans of that. Awesome show. Uh, Stephen Murphy, BSC, ISC for Atlanta, which is another hugely popular show. Ula Pontikos, BSC for Russian Doll, which was Amazing another fa- show, yeah. fantastic looking show. Uh, Christian Sprenger, ASC for Atlanta. So oh, Atlanta uh, yeah. splitting the ballot. <laughs> Again. So, uh, okay. Then one hour commercial television series. The nominees are Marshall Adams, ASC for Better Call Saul. A friend of mine, Jesse Feldman, for uh, Anne Rice's interview with a vampire. Such, it's a uh, beautiful show if you haven't seen it. And Jesse is super cool. We got to have him come on the show and let's do uh, it. Talk about you know all kinds of things. You know, he worked on the room. Really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, we got a, we got a few friends who who worked on the room. I I been wanting to get them all together. You could do like a panel discussion or something. Oh man. So, anyway, okay. Then we've got Christian Tico Herrera for Snowfall. Jules O'Laughlin, ASC, ACS for The Old Man. Okay, so how is The Old Man in two different categories? Great question. I have no idea. One hour commercial television series, maybe because it's commercials, and then there's also the non-commercial television series. Maybe they're, It's a great question. I have no idea how they, they do that. So Maybe somebody listening to this can explain this to us. Yeah, I'd like, I'd like to know that. And then uh, Jaime Reynoso for Snowpiercer. And then uh, last, they've got a documentary category, uh, Ben Bernhard and Riju Das for All That Breathes. Uh, Adam and, Bricker. And then your friend. Yeah, exactly. Again, nominated again for Chef's Table Pizza, which if you haven't seen that, of course, it's all the magic of Chef's Table, but all about pizza. 
And then lastly, uh, Wolfgang Held for This Stolen Country of Mine. So I would encourage anyone uh, listening to this, check all those out. There's some amazing work in there. You know, I think we tend to dwell a lot on the theatrical features, you know, for good reason. They're the state of the art, often the most expensive work in this category. And, and you know, we, we talk about how it's a, a premonition, perhaps, of like the Academy Awards. You know, of course, last year, Greg Frazier won for Dune. Yeah. And Greg Frazier then went on to win the, the Oscar for Dune again. So... Yeah, I mean, you know, and the thing is, like, I'm not I'm not saying any I would bump anyone out of here. But the problem with everything everywhere all at once is that it came out, what, in like May, uh, April or May. And so people don't remember it. And I feel like Larkin's work in that was just phenomenal. And I'd love to see his work kind of featured in this same mix. And, you know, also uh, Bob Richardson. I mean, you know, Linus Sondgren as well. Oh, for of course. Babylon. Babylon, yeah. Yeah. I mean, like there, there's so many great movies out there. This is that time of year. And I feel like it's a different conversation to kind of talk about why is it that the prestige movies aren't getting people into theaters the way mm. they should. Hmm. Um, I think that but, still people are just not in theaters as much as uh, they should be. Well, mm. yeah, except look at Avatar, man. Avatar know, proves Avatar that, pe- is... that people will show up and go to the theater if they're properly incentivized. Uh, I guess Avatar is that incentive because it's like $1.7 billion right now or something like that. Yeah, it's going to hit that $2 billion break-even point. Anyway, we've yacked about this long enough. I think we should get to our interview with Bob Richardson and Antoine Fuqua. Let's do it. The Cinematography Podcast Interview. Antoine Fuqua, director of Emancipation, and Bob Richardson, uh, cinematographer. Bob, I think I've told you before, like, you were one of the names when we started this podcast in 2013. We were like, maybe one day we could get Bob Richardson on here. It would be the most exciting thing that could ever happen. We were, were enormous fans of your work. And Antoine, we're obviously amazing fans of your work. And congratulations on Emancipation. It's just a gorgeous, gorgeous film. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. So uh, before we started recording, Antoine, you and I were chatting briefly about something that I think would be really great to bring up because it's the glue that holds emancipation together. And that's sustained. What? How did you call it? Sustained intensity. Yeah. And I was talking about that scene in Training Day where Ethan Hawke's character gets dropped off at the gang house and Denzel Washington's character takes off and kind of leaves him there. And it's a slow realization of how truly screwed he is and what a horrible situation he's in. And I feel like this movie takes that to 11 and makes it work over the whole film. So I saw it in the theater and then I watched it again the other day on Apple TV. And I just kind of wanted to talk to both of you about how you go about kind of creating that sustained intensity and where a cinematography podcast but you can go beyond lenses and camera movement but if any of that is part of it we'd love to hear it that's all part of it really um you know a lot of it is the discussions we have together me and bob uh, about the material obviously the situations that people are in and then it's just creating the um especially like emancipation the immediate tension is when you when you see people under slave labor as soon as you see that, you see the dogs, you see the guns, you're already sort of leaning in on that idea. And um, once you know that that's the situation, you kind of keep your foot on, on, the, on the gas there, right? Mm-hmm. I remember Bob telling me after we filmed the first scene with Will and he's washing her feet, Bob was, he said to me, the first time you see Will, it has to be in that close up. And that spoke to the, the intention of sustained intention, which is, I've never seen Will look that way. Yeah, for sure. And when he said it, just it just hit me, and I was like, "That's really the tip of the spear. That's where you start with Will." That sort of look. And when Bob, when we first shot that, he said that to me. I thought that's where we got to be most of the movie for the attention. So all that works hand in hand. I mean, I let Bob talk more about the cinematography of it all. Well, well, and to a certain extent, I, I want to shift this. That close up, we didn't shoot in sequence. Antoine did not want to start in the family home. Yeah. He wanted to place Will in the world in which he had to exist as a slave. Mm. A hardest situation for a character. So he's forced not to be able to deal with family and love, which is a much easier place to escort your, your mind as an actor, but um, inside that vehicle, going into the camp, into the railroad camp, and then through hard labor and seeing not only the hard labor, but how Ben was treating other runaways. So his intention was 
to bring Will into there and to guide him as a, as a director and Will as an actor into the hardest places and to let the film progress from that moment into the swamps, which were, of course, extraordinarily difficult in many ways. And one of the goals we had was to provide as much fluidity to his being able to enter those zones, as much safety as possible, because in truth, they're not that safe. So you need people, and we, but we need also a fluid camera to be able to give him the freedom to act as he would act as he's running or stopping or whatever it is he's doing, and uh, as well as the other actors within the movie. And that was a lot of what, why the camera moved in the manner in which it moved, whether it be sweeping shots or in the railroad camp, what he says, like the foot, foot on, the, on the gas. But one thing we did do is we decided pretty early on to not just cut. Antoine said, let's find that pacing. The simple shot of pulling the railroad tie down on, above, they break for water. He's told he can't do the water. He's going to go up and you come across Ben in the foreground mm-hmm. in that scene. Or when they're dragging the man, the man who's just passed away over to the pit to burn him. It's like they're long sweeping shots. And rather than cut, 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 he built that. And then he let it build into this extreme level, which you just spoke about, which is the minute they become runaways. That's a very intense sequence. And we found the slow motion in there, that one moment when he turns and he turns towards the real barbarous ass who loses his hand and takes his hand off. But that was, I think, at 96 frames a second or something akin to that. It took on Will Smith in a very ferocious way. And it's only a short shot of that ferocity. And that's when it just jumped into the swamps with high, high level speed and running and the dogs chasing, et cetera, et cetera. And well, didn't really stop except for the spiritual moments and those moments of rest when he, re- he vaguely took the time to rest. Do you ever uh, cover your ass at all when you're doing these long oneers in case you need to cut out of it later? Or are you jumping without a shoot? Like, you know that it's going to work all the way through and you want to hold that intensity and move on to the next thing. What's your caution level in doing in covering scenes like that? No, we, we were we we're pretty ballsy. <laughs> I mean, you know, it, it was dictating. The film was telling us what it wanted to be. You know, you look at a stick of dynamite, you like the wick, and you just watch it burn. Yeah. You know it's going to be an explosion because you know it's a stick of dynamite. Uh-huh. It's like the wick, and it sparkles, and it shines, and it's almost hypnotic. But you know it's coming. And that's what the, the camp was. And so when Will, when the old man dies, and he had to go over and pick him up and carry him, I remember when... Bob, we wanted the shot. We did the shot, and he was carrying them, and he was carrying them, carrying them over. And I looked at Bob, and I was like, "That's it." We did one shot to show the guy up on the uh, tower with the weapon, just for tension, to, to remind the audience that they had these towers. And we kind of came down once he went all the way across the little bridge and everything, carrying the guy. But the idea of watching, which was slave labor, that's what slavery was to see Will have to carry the guy, have to struggle, have to drag him. Otherwise you wouldn't really feel it. And so when we shot that, we looked at each other, we was like, that's it. Yeah, because we actually took him all the way across that bridge. Took him all the way over. Over, and as opposed, but then you knew you needed, we needed the reverse of the drop. So at some point you're gonna make a cut to something. And And that was only because we needed it to get the reverse side of it, but it wasn't- Not because- We didn't cover our ass. We shot it. It, I mean, it felt like something you were using intentionally, uh, not to the extreme level of like a children of men kind of a thing. But when you watch it, you're like, as soon as I fell myself in one of those moments, I was like, something's about to happen. Like, I feel like as an audience member in a good way, it like built up that tension because you kind of created that language at the top of the film. Uh, can we talk about the look, the look of the movie, uh, old photographs or daguerreotypes or, uh, where did the inspiration for that look come from? Peter's back. Peter's back, yeah. That, that whipped photo of the um, scorch back. You know, it's so brutal. It's otherworldly. I remember talking to Bob and we would zoom in on it. Like, you know, and I remember me and Bob talking one day and I said, you know, if you were flying over mountains and you didn't know where you were and you pulled all the way back and realized you're on somebody's back. Well, actually, Antoine created a section that was a tail credit sequence, which literally did exactly what he's talking about. It started within, and you, you do think you're looking at another planet until you pull out far yeah. enough 
and read and see uh, the molding of the side and then the body. It was, uh, I don't know exactly what camera that was. What, like, was it a daguerreotype? Was it on some kind of film or like, it was on was a film it? stock? And if you watch them, um, we had a special photographer come in to shoot some of the material. Same sort of camera, which is yeah. a simple lens. Film goes down, you pull it off, and you expose for X number of seconds because the film was so slow. And yeah, so that color, which it's aged, I'm curious if originally it had more silver or whether it's become that sort of golden. Because when you look at the skin tones that we tried to work on with Will, because he kept, uh, Antoine kept pushing to make sure that they were wet and hot. Yes. Have these reflections, which brought the skin tones out like I've never seen. And then the tonalities of choosing a color, you know, it altered the, the density of Will's own color. Because if you look at that, many people would not have known that that was Will Smith in photographs early on. But if Will was a slave during that period, working out in the field, it'd be much darker and much harsher looking. So that's where a lot of that came from. You know, the idea of the film was beautiful and brutal, right? Yeah. If you look at a Delacroix painting or a Toravaggio painting, they're beautiful, but they could be very brutal. For me, when I think about slavery and, and the more we dug into it, me and Bob did images and talked about it. There's a book called Without Sanctuary about lynching in America. It doesn't even feel like it's the same planet. It feels like if you were taken to an alien planet, imagine how a slave would feel. You're ripped from your home. You're taken across the ocean and then you're dropped into a place. You like it's an alien planet. You don't even speak the language. You don't. You know. Don't speak the language. Exactly. No, you, you no have, common culture. Nothing at all. So all of a sudden you're in, a, you're in an alien world. And and the more we discuss that, and more Bob and Robert got to like, test and send the images and would fly across. He would do things with drones and iPhones and <laughs> I would look. He was out scouting some days out in these swamps and he would send me images and it was just like. This was a different planet. And if you were a slave, what would that perspective look like? Mm. Probably lack of color. It wouldn't be like the classic Hollywood Hallmark look where everything's golden and people were singing Kumbaya in a cotton field with guys with guns. You know, <laughs> right? it, but Hollywood had the tendency to, to paint that picture. And we said, no, we're not going to, we're going to lift the veil and we're going to let people witness what it be, what it really was. And that had a lot to do with the look of it and also how we handled the camera. Which is, you know, it brings up an interesting point for me. Um, the story is a love story. And it does take place in this arena, which is very complex and difficult. But it's a love story. And in the long run, a man trying to get back to his family and fighting, fighting against insurmountable obstacles to achieve that. Um, but it's also, it's an action film. It has, there are these chase sequences, which are really almost a second act is... Mm -hmm primarily a chase. So it's not like the film that people who haven't seen it think it is. It's not that film only. It envelopes a number of different arenas in terms of story, which yeah. I think makes it tremendously unique. And yeah. Well, there's something about a film about a real subject like this that people think it can't be entertaining. And our number one job is to entertain. It is, it is cinema. It is entertainment, right? And all those are horrific past of the United States. Um, it is a movie. And so we made a film about a guy on the run from a horrible situation, obviously true story, to get back to his family, really. So, you know, there's a tendency for people to feel like these films are only supposed to be, I guess, uh, these very quiet, home-based whipping tropes. Yeah. I don't know, I don't know what, what it is, but couldn't possibly be the true story. It couldn't possibly be a story of a guy on the run. It's a guy on the run. He escapes and he's he's trying to find his way to Lincoln to get freedom. Yeah, yeah. No, it almost feels like a Western. In a, I mean, there are a lot of Westerns where it's a guy on the run from, you know, people trying to catch him. As Antoine said, it's also Gladiator. Yeah, it's for sure. Gladiator is about a slave. And, and that really happened in Rome, right? They took yeah. people, fed them to the lions and had them entertain them. That really happened. Uh, you look at Spartacus, Kubrick's film, Kirk Douglas, he played a slave. But somehow, whenever it's a film in the United States about slavery, we want to put it into this box that it can't be entertaining. You can't make a film that's, you know, 
has any cinematic quality to it. It has to just be about this simple, uh, almost Hallmark type of situation. Uh, that's not the film we were making. Mm. Let me just uh, jump in here real, real quick. What really struck me about Emancipation as I was watching it, and I want to say there's a visceral quality. And we're talking about tension. We're talking about the, the fact that it's a chase movie. It's an action movie. But the combination of different frame rates, and it's so meticulous, all of these different shots kind of leading one into the next for the, these elaborate sequences. But I'm struck from beginning to end how visceral the movie is, how every single thing that happens on the screen has so much texture and feeling and intensity like as you're going through and finding your your sequences are you having that conversation of like what's the more intense feeling or is this uh, too over the top how do you break down that sort of level of how visceral each of these sequences go because it's a roller coaster and you have sort of like the, the ramping up and then the ebbing down a little bit but ultimately you sustain these incredible feelings that come through the movie almost constantly. So it's like, how do, how do you decide here? We need to put foot on the gas here. We need to, to, to take it off. How, how does that come to be? How does your, your pacing? I know it's not all just in the edit. It's so meticulous. It's, it's happening, you know, on the day. Well, cause, because you're a loving, feeling good human being, <laughs> so, you know, some people are not, but you know, it's a feeling it's music. It's a feeling it's, we spend a lot of time designing shots and discussing them, especially with someone like Bob. Bob is a filmmaker. Bob is the first cinematographer I've spent time with more than anybody else. Bob would sit with me and we would talk and we would lay out storyboards more than any cinematographer I've worked with. Um, he's into the story with you. And then we would get there on the day and just feel it. And, and to your point with the tension, a lot of times it wasn't what was happening in front of you, it was happening behind you. So. When he's being brought to the slave pen the first time and Will's there, the guy's pushing him along. And the guy behind him, we come up from a drone all the way over the bridge. And the guy took a break from working and gets shot in the head. It, it, so it was all happening around you. It was in layers of things. It wasn't just yeah. always in front of you. And so a lot of it was, it was how we felt in the moments. And me and Bob were really in sync. And we would just look at each other or talk to each other and just go, that's it. We're not, we're not shooting anything else. Let's go to the next setup. We got it, you know. But it's all, it's visual because you you feel it. We would get a little opposition periodically from the producer's tent. Yeah. Not, not like do this, but they would say, well, don't you think? Like the simple shot of Will Smith and then Ben shows up behind him and says, I'm your God. Uh, yeah. And it's done in one shot. And then he says, you know, you are my dog now or something to that line. And it pulls focus back to Will. And Will says, well, if I'm your dog, maybe you'll give me some of that meat you give your dog. You know, it's like it never pulls back to Ben's response. And I remember we shot that and we were walking away from the setup. And one of the producers came and said, you need to get a shot of Ben. And I looked at Antoine, you know, moments later and said this was brought up and he goes, fuck no. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. And that's the kind of attitude that he and I, we both have a language. It's like, if he goes like, you know, what do you think about this? And I go, mm-hmm. If he'll go, uh-huh, I'm oh, sure you don't like that one. And like, sometimes I'll go like, you know, I was thinking, he'll go like, mm, that's interesting. I'll go, all right, you don't like that one. And it's a <laughs> very cool relationship because you can be open and then, yeah. nope. Okay, yeah. we'll move on. Let's find something that we like a little bit better. It's like, um, that was- that feed was off fun. each other, right? I know, I, know, I know Bob now. So I would say, Bob, I, I'd love to shoot this thing. And Bob would go, yeah, yeah, yeah we can do that. Okay. And I was like, he doesn't want to do this. <laughs> <laughs> what brought you two guys together on this project? I'm, I'm assuming, Antoine, you reached out to Bob. Yeah, I've been wanting to work with Bob. I mean, I. I watched Heaven and Earth a few months before this came about, and I had a meeting with Oliver. He's the friend, and I've always wanted to work with Bob. And uh, when I got this material, he's the first person I thought about. And I thought, wow, if I can get Bob Richardson, that'd be great. And he told me no at first, because uh, he can explain to you himself. Uh, well, that's the primary reason I think we might have talked a little bit is that I'm white. And did I feel comfortable being in a position of making a story about race? from a perspective of, uh, of a white person. Antoine worked hard on that one with me and 
it just was like, you're another human being, Richardson, fuck off. You know, <laughs> end of the conversation. You feel the same way about what I feel. You just come from a different perspective. It isn't your history, but it's our history. And I think it's a very important reason for why this film needs to be made. It, you don't need to blame people right now. We need to find a way to find some harmony and peace. And uh, to get past this, it seems to be quite difficult to do in this contemporary time, but it is worth the effort. Well, and I'm sorry to go off on this track necessarily, but you also shot Django Unchained, which is a very entertaining movie that takes place in slavery. That was the story of a slave that was written and directed by a, a white man. Were there any connections or disconnections between this and Django? None. Django, Django, it really is not emancipation. It's, you know, Quentin creates his world. It's Quinn, It's really Quentin's world. You feel it. It was clearly a different film. Yeah. And it's like going to, you know, Inglorious. You know, it's, that's a very different subject matter altogether, but again, hits some of the same notes. For sure. So, no, we didn't have those discussions uh, on the film. With Antoine, we had it because you're, you're aiming at that target specifically. Well, and I understand that this is like more of a, it's not a history channel show, but it's a story of the history of a real person. And Django is playing with genre. So maybe it's easier to, to do that. I think it's interesting that that was your, uh, your gut reaction though. And uh, I'm you know, obviously couldn't be happier that, that the two of you had that conversation and still uh, decided to work on the film because your work is just amazing on it. I'm glad it worked out. <laughs> you know, it's, it's really great that you were able to to find your footing and to be able then to it, it sounds like you guys are going to be uh, working together again. It sounds like it was a really positive experience. Yeah, we just did it together in Italy. We just finished mm -hmm. together. So oh, it's always great to have a partner like another filmmaker. When you, you know, you're, Ben Foster came in and he was another partner. You know, Ben wouldn't oh. even leave the set. This guy used to sit on the set when he wasn't even shooting that day in full costume and He's hang so out. So great. It was fantastic. I think, man. I think Ben Foster is like one of the great underappreciated actors of this time. Like, I, I don't understand why he hasn't had a giant star vehicle or something that blew him up because he brings it every time. I mean, your casting is impeccable in the movie. And I could not in any world imagine a different actor in that role. No, Ben was incredible. I and mean, he's I don't think he wants the big star. Thing. He's a family oriented guy. Uh, my first time working with Ben, I always wanted to. Ben would come to the set. Like I said, he would sit there. And me and Bob were over here, and I looked over, and I see Fassel. And I was like, what the hell's Fassel doing every day? And he would just sit there, and he'd have his pipe, man. He was sitting there with the dog, and I, and I loved him. Because <laughs> he was just in it. He was just over there by himself, quiet. He was in it. And that's how we got certain shots with Rob Legato, our second unit guy. We literally, I would turn to Bob, and Bob would go like, oh, this light is pretty good. He would call Rob and go, Rob, let's get Ben, take Ben over there. Let's get that shot of him on the horse. And Ben would go get it. And come back and we'd look at it. No, I'm not good. Go do it again. He'd go do it again. <laughs> and Bob would tell Rob, that light's horrible. Go shoot him again. No, shoot him tomorrow. Ben literally would not leave the set. I mean, can you blame him? He could watch the two of you guys work. I mean, seriously, if I had the opportunity to watch you two specifically work every day, I, I you couldn't get me off that set. That Like, you know, both of you just do such amazing work. I would love to see any part of how you put it together. Well, also, oh, Will was very much like this. Will wouldn't leave. Yes. Will's he, incredible. So many people were going through the tremendous heat and all suffering. You know, they were wearing wool, heady clothing and miserable conditions. And Will respected that. So it wasn't like he, he didn't go to his trailer. He hung. Even if he wasn't in the shot, he would hang. He just cared. And I think Ben was the same way. And I think that brought a lot of respect from all the extras that were watching and other actors because they realized yeah we're not going back no that sets quite a tone too like i feel like the lead actor sets the tone for almost any any film and uh that kind of attitude will bring up the esprit de corps and make everyone feel like they're in it together that's pretty amazing all right we're being begged to wrap it up thank you guys so much for coming on the cinematography podcast again i i can't overstate what big fans of both of your work we are and uh i hope that uh when the nominations come out that we see emancipation uh, mentioned copiously i appreciate it. i'm glad you guys enjoyed it most uh, thank you be safe out here. you too so holy crap that was like uh the realization of a long-held dream 
for me anyway. Yeah, it was it was so much fun. I, I'm really looking forward to having them both back on the show again. It was, oh my god, it was great. I, I just I would love to talk to each one of them individually for like a full career spanning episode. And now, short ends. So, Ilya, it is time for our uh, patent pending short end segment uh, where we talk about our pet obsession of the week. What is your pet obsession? Well, it's not so much a, an obsession, but uh, Nicolas Cage was on a podcast recently and he got asked the question. Um, Pedro Pascal had been mentioning that he really wanted his, uh, you know, his co-star from the unbearable weight of massive talent, Nicolas Cage, to be mm. on The Mandalorian, to be in the the Star Wars universe, to be like, you know, to be part of it. And when asked about this, uh, the, the the gentleman who was conducting the interview, Kevin Poloi, he got quite the reaction, which was no, like a flat no. And Nicolas Cage says he's a Trekkie. He's not into the Star Wars family. He's in the Star Trek family. And that so it's just like it's a hard pass on Star Wars for him. OK, I mean, <laughs> uh, uh, look, I'm not here to crap on Nicolas Cage. I think Nicolas Cage is a true artist and I love his work. However doesn't seem like he says no a whole lot it doesn't seem like he says no a whole lot and it, it does seem that like even if he was in star wars it wouldn't necessarily prevent him from doing something in star trek they'd certainly have people who are crossing sort of like you know the marvel dc universes i'm pretty sure that the other big franchise that there's there's room enough for him there too i don't think that he would like miss out if he if he accepted a star wars role maybe that was just his his like flex at <laughs> at star trek to say Maybe. like, hey, Star Trek, you know, put me put me in Star Trek. Yeah. Put me in the captain's chair. Yeah. Oh, my God. Can you imagine a Star Trek series with Nicolas Cage as the captain? You know how awesome that would be. Like, I kind of feel like everyone at Paramount should be paying attention right now. It's like, how can we get Nicolas Cage in the red shirt? No. Get Nicolas oh, my God. <laughs> I would I would not stop watching that show. I would be so into that. But I mean, like, I'd see him in Star Wars, too. I mean, there's an alternate universe, you know, that like uh, David Lynch, when he made Dune, he was at the same time offered Return of the Jedi. Mm. And I often think, what, what would David Lynch's Return of the Jedi have been like? And how badly do I wish I could see David Lynch's Return of the Jedi? And by extension, his lead actor from Wild at Heart, he could have sucked right into his Return of the Jedi. And then Nicolas Cage would be, uh, you know, Palpatine or something. <laughs> It, it could have happened. And let me tell you, all of those Ewoks would be like talking backwards inside of a room with weird curtains. I'm so, so into that. Yeah. I, all right. So, so Ben, what is your uh, obsession this week? What's your short end? Um, so my wife is awesome. Mm, okay. And, great. Thank you. For, Thanks for the update. For, yeah. <laughs> for Christmas, she heard me make an offhand comment about something that I thought looked cool. Mm. And it's not the most expensive thing, but it's not super cheap. It's an interface for editing. You can use it for literally any program. You can set it up to work with any program. But it it's, looks like a giant fidget spinner. Yeah, so it's it's called the Tor Box, hmm. and it's a Bluetooth device. It's kind of kind of heavy. It's got some heft to it, and think about it as like a mouse on crack. <laughs> it looks like a schizophrenic mouse. <laughs> yeah, it's got a lot of buttons and knobs. It does, and they're it, all the same color. Do you ever like well, glance yeah, down I, and think you're, and think you're turning one? And yeah. so here's the whole point of the tour box is you're not really supposed to look down at it while you're working. You're supposed to develop. And I've been using it on the projects I've been editing in the last couple of weeks. And I can tell you now having dicked around with it, not dicked around with it. I'm like, I'm using it to actually edit projects that I'm working on. It really is a huge time saver. And the it's so funny when you learn how to edit. The first thing that everyone will tell you is like, you don't want to use the mouse too much. You want to use the keyboard because you can be faster, you know, and it's because you know where all the keys are. And what this has done is it's taken most of the functions and you can program. There's like a lot of unused functionality in this. You can add new shortcuts. I think they want you to do that. Mm. And basically the idea is don't touch your keyboard. Just have one hand on this thing. Have your left hand on this, your right hand on the mouse. And you can edit basically without hardly touching the keyboard at all. And what's cool about it is when you get used to the idea of it, you can do stuff really fast because you're not dealing with the keyboard and a bunch of different functions. It's like you're hitting a button that's got a bunch of macros plugged into it. I want to say out loud, we're not sponsored by them. Uh, my <laughs> wife paid hard money for this. It, so It uh, looks like a reject from like a proposed PlayStation remote controller or something like that. Or maybe it's the universal remote you always wanted but didn't know you wanted. And it's got, you know, knobs and 
God, dials. Yeah, it's it's kind of like the back of a DSLR, but a, flattened a bit, out. Yeah. And you're not wrong. Yeah, it's yeah, <laughs> it's like this is like a jog, and this is like for uh, zooming in and out on the uh, uh, on the timeline. This uh, is a, for kind of scrubbing on the timeline. Is there mark in and out? <laughs> yes, uh, this is sorry the razor tool. I'm sorry, I'm I'm describing something that people can't see. Yeah, it's because like dancing listening. about architecture right now. Very much. But uh, you can go to their website and see it. It was an Indiegogo funded device, I believe. And uh, I'm... Uh, You're sold. I, I'd, say, I'd say, am I sold? I don't know. Like, I, I have had somebody gave me oh, this yeah. other one, like uh, which was the Contour Shuttle Pro. Mm. And I thought I would like it, and I didn't really care for it. <laughs> didn't do it for you. Yeah. And it's because... I had to keep looking down at it and the functionality wasn't like all there. This this actually has pretty good functionality and it also easily switches programs or even within the same program. So if I'm in Adobe Premiere and I go into color correction, I can just push a button and I'm in color correction. And because it's like these micro fine dials, you have you're able to control it's much better than trying to do it with a mouse. You know, it can work with any program and they've built presets, but you can also, I think the whole idea is to customize it. And uh, anyway, if you find yourself editing a lot, you might like it. It, it takes a little getting used to because it is a control surface. But what's interesting is, yeah, you're right. It does look weird and random, but once your hand is on it, you start kind of just knowing where everything is supposed to be. And then, by the way, it makes a fine fidget toy. Like the whole time I've been, I've been doing this, uh, these host traps with you, I've been you, fidgeting, been fidgeting with, with it. Nonstop. With it, like, yeah. it, it doesn't yeah, make it, a lot of loud clicking noises, though. So at least that's uh, good. Not, not when it's turned off, but it yeah. does give you haptic feedback when it's turned on. So it does actually make lots of loud clicking, not loud, but clicking noises. All right. All right I'm convinced. I want to try it now. I could use to speed up my edit. So, yeah, I'd, I'd give it a shot. Well, maybe the next time I see you, uh, I'll uh, I'll bring it over there and we can uh, pair it with your computer and you can check it out. Is it a pain in the butt to program all those macro sort of controls? No, no, because it's got a bunch of it built in. Mm. And then uh, if you want to add them, it, there's just an app that it comes with and you can just go in and very quickly program them. Yeah, because I've seen some of these sort of like uh, universal device editing accessories you need to know like a programming language to actually get anything into it it's a a, a whole well i i'm not that guy so if it if it became that for me i would just uh send it back (laughs) okay well cool cool i'm glad it's uh it's easy so so ben that's just gonna about do it for our our episode here where can people find you if they want to track you down please go to benrock.com you can also find me on mastodon i don't think that there's a mastodon thing on benrock.com because i don't think uh, squarespace has that yet you can find me on twitter for the time being at neptune salad go to find me on linkedin too i, I just updated my profile recently and uh, i'm kind of proud of it where can people find you Ilya? Uh, they can find me over at Hot Rod Cameras, hotrodcameras.com. In fact, actually, someone did find me over here who is a fan of the podcast. Uh, they could not find our email address for the podcast. So I'm actually going to say it this time. So in case anyone else wants to reach out to me for something purely podcast related, uh, you can email us at email at camnoir.com. So email at camnoir.com. And you can reach us that way, too. Uh, if you want to send a, a email all about, uh, you know, your love of the show or the questions that you have. And to the person who did reach out to Hot Ride Cameras, they got forwarded to me and you will get an answer. Ooh, mysterious. It's, now it's I want not, to know. It's not so mysterious. I just have to find it now, and I'm, I'm not sure where it is. So, but, uh, <laughs> but yes, it did get forwarded to me, and it was long, so I didn't get to read the whole thing. So. Excellent. And uh, we have, I don't, I don't want to brag or boast here, but we have another heavy hitting, uh, maybe we could get this person on the show one day kind of uh, interview coming up next week. So uh, we, we sure do. They've already been on the show though. That's true. That's true. So, but it was, it's still, still, great, still always great exciting talking. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So Ilya, who should we thank before we go? Hey, let's thank Alana Cody. Alana Cody, who put together this interview and then of course uh, put together the, the interview next week and many, many weeks coming up. She's also busily working on our Sundance 2023 swing right now. So we're going to have Sundance movies to watch here before you know it. Sweet. Uh, we should also thank Ben Katz. Ben Katz, who's editing all the, wor- the words that we are saying to make sure that we don't say things uh, too terribly wrong or pronounce things bad or just say, uh, for a long period of time. I, I usually do. Yeah, so do I. And uh, last, let's thank Kay's Alatrakshi, who, who? Uh, composed... Kay's Alatrakshi. I'm sorry, who, you've heard of him. who is that? I... <laughs> Nobody's ever heard of Kay's. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Kay's work is just amazing. I've worked with him several times as a composer, and he's a great friend. You could have a great friend in K's too. Just go to musicbyk's.com. Anyway, Ilya, I think that about does it for us. You want to take us out? Thanks for listening. 
This has been the Cinematography Podcast, presented by Hot Rod Cameras. Find your next camera, lens, or accessory on the web at hotrodcameras.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our show on iTunes and connect with us on Facebook and Twitter. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.